I wish I did. Well, let me use my last question before we throw it open to the group to ask you something that I found particularly interesting and that, and that James Wood picked up on in the New Yorker piece. You quote the Gospels a lot. And in a sense, th this book really is a, it's a, it's a, it's a strong argument for the relevance of the Gospels to contemporary life. What is the authority of Scripture for you? Is it, is it saying things that we know to be right because our experience of the world teaches us that they're right? Or is there an authority that Scripture has over and above that? And you're a, you're a man who's spent his life reading texts and, and talking about the authority of texts. What, what is the authority of the Bible? And how should we be wielding that authority, going back to my question, in contemporary religious life? Yeah. Let, let, let me say, perhaps, first of all, that unlike certain strands of postmodernism, I don't have any particular problem with the idea of authority. It is strange, isn't it, how so many people think that authority is ipso facto oppressive authority or hierarchical or patriarchal. Whereas what about the authority of those who have been involved in political struggle? The authority which speaks out of dearly won experience. Yes. It's rather like the idea of power. You know, um, liberals don't like the idea of power very much and neither do postmodernists. Whereas as far as I'm concerned, I, I can't get enough of it. You know, you know, mad about the stuff, you know. Power is an excellent thing. You know, most of those people who think it isn't are people who haven't quite enough of it to be going on with, yes. Power for the powerless is an egg. It all depends on power. It all depends on who has it, for what purposes, in what situation. Yes. Now, I think the same with authority. Authority, etymologically, of course, means from the horse's mouth. Author, source, that which can be validated because we know and respect what source it's coming from. When the gospel writer, I can't remember which it is, says he, Jesus spoke with authority. Um, certainly didn't mean, I suppose, he was domineering. Um, I, well, I um, find, as in, in, in the sense I was just saying before, when I was talking about that paradox in Christianity, if you love, they'll kill you, I find that corresponds enormously to my experience of such as it is, of, of history. Um, uh, and I suspect that any creed or way of talking that hasn't taken that on board um, is going to be grievously lacking in some way. I, a few years ago, wrote a book on uh, tragedy. I've become very interested in tragedy. Um, uh, although I've now written so many books, I'm not quite sure when that was, and it even, God help me, the title is A Sweet Violence, it was called, yes. I have, my problem as a writer is the opposite of most other academics. I can't stop writing. I mean, I've tried hypnosis, you know, <laughs> seen the doctor, tablets of various kinds, you know, wearing boxing gloves permanently, <laughs> yeah. but I just can't, can't stop. Um, anyway, I'm interested in tragedy because I think that tragedy is a sort of, it, it exactly takes up that, par that paradox that only by having the power to stare on the very worst, on the real, as it were, can one have a hope, a frail hope of getting beyond it. That dialectic, that double movement, I think, characterizes both the New Testament and a great deal of tragedy. And in both cases, one of the linking terms, but this is, we don't have time to speak of this, is the idea of the scapegoat, which is blessed and cursed, which is hope and failure, which is submission and transcendence at the same, same time. The distinction between Ditchkins and those like myself comes down in the end to one between liberal humanism and tragic humanism. Yes. yes. I think that's right. I think what a, the dis disagreement between myself and somebody like Dawkins is not over evolution or even over God, I don't think. It's over a, a view of the world, which may be relevant to God and evolution. And that is that I think that Dawkins really, really thinks, you know, in his heart that everything's okay. You know, I can't imagine how anybody could, anybody could believe that. I think the world... <laughs> The world doesn't divide so much between left and right. It divides between people who think that and people like me who can't understand how anybody could think that for a moment. You know, Dawkins, in his rather you know, brisk sort of Victorian progress progressive way, 
thinks, of course, there are pockets of horror here and there, but we are steadily en route to mopping them up and, you know, to moving, you know, marching merrily ahead into whatever bright future it's planned. I mean, it, 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 I, I sound as though I'm caricaturing it. I swear I'm not. You know, uh, it, it's almost as though in Dawkins' perspective, two awful world wars, the tragedy of the Holocaust, and so on, just don't fear. You know, uh, uh, as though we don't have to take thought after those unspeakable events and ask ourselves what, what could faith or rationality or knowledge mean after that. 